This is the Leadership Lessons Podcast, hosted by Pastor Daniel Williams, a podcast to encourage and equip church leaders. Brought to you by eeleader.com. Welcome back, guys. Episode number six, we are going to have Jason Sanchez, a good friend of mine, share on the way that God works. Obviously, we know that man plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. God knows exactly what he is doing. He is sovereign. He is in control, and he is having victory over sin, death, and the enemy. And I just want you to be encouraged by that. Many people as a pastor, they seek and they and they worry and they stress about not knowing what's going to happen next. But we have a God that does know what's going to happen next. He knows the beginning and the end, and he's using all things together to work for our good. Maybe I'm saying it just for me because honestly, I have many weeks, many days, many seasons where I am struggling, where I am trying to fight for control, where I don't know what's going to happen. I put all this effort and energy into a message or ministry and I can't control the fruit, but God can. And I need people in my life to remind me of this. And so Jason knows this firsthand. Jason is a good dear friend, ministry in, in, in the gospel, a uh, ministry partner in the gospel. We as a church support him and his wife and the uh, as directors of an orphanage in uh, Mexico. It's the House of Blessing. Um, really, really encouraged by the work. I've gone down there probably six to seven, uh, maybe even eight times, uh, and just have seen God work in multiple ways through this guy's life. Uh, He's growing, and he had to grow a lot because we were both youth pastors in Washington State. When I went to... um, Florida, he went to Mexico. And so about the same time we were starting new works in different ministry areas, I was planning a church and he was uh, planning an orphanage, helping uh, widows and orphans in need. And so when we as a church started from the very first day, our 10% of all of our tithes and offerings goes to church planning and mission and even above that now percentage wise. And so uh, we've been able to support them financially, but also pray for them, go on mission trips and and just uh, have... Um, just support uh, through conversation and serving and loving and um, helping them out as much as we can. And so Jason really had to grow in his understanding of how the Lord works. And I think he has a really great wisdom and insight in that because in Mexico, things just don't go always as you planned. Uh, Oftentimes, I've been there, you're wanting to do work and you all of a sudden lose power or your water just stops and you have to fix the well. Uh, Things like that sort of happen a lot. And we take it for granted. We have these boundaries and planners and systems, but I think that we need to trust God and not all of these plans, all of these systems. These are tools to help us do what we need to do. Uh, I'm blessed. Uh, I, I think technology is a blessing. That's how we're, uh, I'm able to speak to you right now through video. I'm in my office and just sharing my heart with you. But the reality is I don't rely on that. I rely on the power of the Holy Spirit and what He's doing in me and through me to be able to pour out into you. And so um, really encouraged, really blessed by Jason and the work that him and his wife and really many others are doing. We also as a church support the pastor in that area. Jason not only serves as a director in orphanage, but he also serves as an elder at the local church in that small town of about Bashinava and about 3,000 people or so. And so God is doing a special work in Mexico. Excited to have him share his wisdom and insight of how he's learning that and growing and talk about the ways that God works. Enjoy. Hi, my name is Jason Sanchez. I'm the director of House of Blessing Orphanage or Casa de Bendición located in uh, Bachinaba, Chihuahua, Mexico. And uh, I'm really excited to be able to just to share with you guys a little bit of what the Lord has been teaching Uh, me, uh, my family, and our team down in Mexico. Uh, This January, it actually will be seven years since the Lord called us to pack up our things, um, leave our family, leave our home church up in Seattle, Washington, and move down to Bashinava. Bashinava is about um, five hours south of El Paso, Texas. And we just went in faith, just trusting the Lord, believing that He had called us to go down start an orphanage. We had no idea what it looked like, uh, what it would be like. Really, we didn't even know the crazy uh, path and steps that it would take to sort of get to uh, where we're at today. And that's kind of what I want to talk to you about because 
For those of you that are in ministry, whether you're pastors, uh, missionary, church planner, uh, Christian, uh, elder, servant, um, I know that you'll be able to relate to some of these things because let's be honest, um, nothing usually works out the way we think it does, but it always works out because we have a big God and He is always in control. And uh, one of the verses that has been a life verse to me and really has become um, very, very important and critical in my life is actually Philippians 4, uh, verses 6 through 7. Let me read it. It says, uh, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. We have so needed God's peace uh, in the last seven years since being down in a foreign country doing a work that we have never done before. Uh, and also being reminded not to worry. I can be a bit of a worrier. I uh, can struggle with anxiety. And uh, Paul makes it very clear, hey, you don't worry about anything, but pray about everything. And the reward in doing that is God's peace, which surpasses all understanding. Philippians is one of my favorite books. I love reading it. I love teaching through it. Um, but something recently that the Lord has been speaking to me about through this book is not just the book uh, and this letter from Paul to the church in Philippi, but how the church actually got started. And we get a glimpse of that in Acts chapter 16. And I think it is so cool that Paul and his uh, team of people, as the gospel was being spread, revival was taking place, um, as they desired just to continue to travel and to preach the gospel, uh, they had one plan. They had a certain desire, and their desire, Acts 16 tells us, that they wanted to go preach uh, the word up in Asia. And obviously that's a good thing when you wanna go into uncharted territories and preach the word for people to hear uh, the gospel message. But we read that not once, but actually twice, the Holy Spirit forbid them to do this. Now this is something really, um, I think sometimes confusing <laughs> to read. Sometimes um, you just wonder why in the world would God, why in the world would the Holy Spirit forbid them? It's one thing, let's say you're planning a church and you go into an area and you need to get a permit for the church or you're down in Mexico and we've had to apply for visas and paperwork and all this stuff. It's one thing when the government says no or a lawyer says no or somebody says, sorry, we can't give you this permit or we can't do this. But it's a little bit strange to me when it's God saying no. And so here Paul and his team, they're no doubt in a place of probably wondering what is going on. We have had incredible success. They're coming off a time when, when they had just encouraged a body of believers. It tells us that the churches not only were strengthened, but that they increased daily. So they came off of sort of this mountain high experience to now this low valley area of God, where are you going to take us? And it tells us that they have a vision. Paul has this vision from a man in Macedonia. And this man is crying and urging them to come and to help them. And I love what it says in verse 10. And I think this is so critical for us as, as leaders and as people in ministry. It says, when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel. And so Paul, this was a very critical moment where they, it was sort of like a make or break moment, I think. Their conclusion could have either have been, we're given up, doors have closed not once, but twice. We don't know what to go. Uh, we don't know what to do. We're discouraged. We're frustrated. It's, we're quitting. Or they could do what Paul did. And it says that he concluded that God. Paul was so in touch with what Christ had done in his life, what he had saved him from. He wanted nothing but to serve the Lord with everything that he had. And as a result of that, he was able to literally conclude these doors closed because God must want something down in Macedonia. 
And the story goes on in, in the chapter. When they go down there, they first meet this lady named Lydia down by the river. People would often go down there to pray. They went down there, started talking. She gets saved. Her household gets saved. They get baptized. And then after that, they run into a demon-possessed uh, slave girl. And this girl was bringing great wealth and success to her owners. Uh, this sort of fortune-telling, demon-possessed girl. Well, she was following Paul and these guys around, and it says that Paul, being greatly annoyed, he cast this demon out. And the demon came out, this girl was freed, and you would think that this is an incredible moment. I imagine those that were with Paul just, oh my gosh, miracles are taking place, salvations are taking place. Uh, we are back on that mountaintop experience. Well, no sooner had that happened, Paul and Silas find themselves being dragged into the marketplace before the magistrates. And it's there that these owners are complaining against Paul and Silas. And the Bible tells us in, in Acts chapter 16, verse 20, the magistrates say, hey, these guys, they are Jews and they are disturbing our city. I love that word disturbing. I like that when God calls us to places, hopefully we can be a disturbance, not in a bad way, not disturbing our neighbors because we're loud, not disturbing people because we're being rude or we're breaking laws, but disturbing people in a way because God is doing a work through us. I think down in Mexico, in some regards, we are disturbing our little city in a good way. Our city is about 2,000 people up in the beautiful Sierra Madres. And we have 40 acres. We have an ever-growing campus. It's one of the first buildings and sites that you see as you come into town. There's a big sign, so no doubt we stand out. We are right there. And I think people are seeing, wow, this ministry, this place, this group of people, they are having an impact. They are taking in kids. Lives are being changed. And all of that to God be the glory. And so these guys being used by God, but being viewed by the town as disturbing their town because they had freed this girl from a demon possess possession, and now they are losing money because she's no longer fortune telling from them. And so as a result of this incredible miracle, the Bible tells us that Paul and Silas actually got beat and then thrown in jail. So think about this, especially as church leaders. <laughs> you have experienced some of the most amazing things, conversion, miracles, being freed from demon possession. And as a result of that, you're thrown into prison. Now, I think for me to say that this past seven years has been the biggest roller coaster in my life is probably a bit of an understatement. Why do we use that phrase, a roller coaster? Well, on the roller coaster, you are going up and down and left and right, and you're turning and you're spinning and you're going fast and you're going slow, and it can seem like the craziest ride. I imagine a lot of you uh, have experienced something like that in the ministry. I mean, that is what takes place. We don't get into the ministry and then everything is smooth sailing, put on cruise control, and you never go over a speed bump. You never uh, veer to the right or the left. Everything is smooth sailing. It sometimes feels like it is the opposite of that, doesn't it? It feels like when you are, let's say, first Sunday uh, of your new church building, it's packed out, the offering uh, is, is big, things are going good, you feel like you kind of crushed it in your sermon, you go home pumped, excited, stoked, can't wait for the next Sunday, next Sunday rolls around, half the people are there, nobody ties, you feel like you stunk in your message, and then you want to quit, and you are back down in that valley. And that is just something that I think is, as leaders in, in people ministry, and really even just as Christians, we face that and we go through that. And so this was another critical time for Paul and Silas. Kind of a make or break situation. Now for me personally, I would feel like uh, I'm done. <laughs> I forget this. Maybe even wondering, is this going to be it? Are we going to die? But I love what it says in verse 25. It doesn't say that Paul and Silas were complaining. 
It doesn't say that they were grumbling. It doesn't say that they were crying or that they were whining. It says this, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. So in a moment where if anybody had justification to quit, to give up, to be frustrated, to be angry, it was these guys. And yet we don't see the, what great encouragement we see from two individuals who are in prison, having been beaten, and they are praying and they are worshiping. I got to be honest, there have been times when down in Mexico where I have felt like I made the worst mistake of my life. I moved my family down here. I left a great job at a growing church. We sold our house. I left all of that to come down here to experience difficulty after difficulty after difficulty. And those are those moments that are so critical in our life. And sadly, a lot of people in ministry, a lot of pastors, a lot of missionaries, that is when they quit and they just can't go on. And so they go back to a normal job, uh, they quit the ministry, and a lot of times there are often people that they even quit on God and they give up. And so that's why verses like this, I think are so powerful and so profound for us. And we need stuff like this. We need to be reminded that when it feels like we are sitting in a dark prison, and this tells us that they were not just in a prison, but it says they were in the inner prison and their feet were fastened in the stocks. Yet these guys were so in love with the Lord, it was like we are going to pray and we are going to sing no matter what. And here's what's so cool about this. It goes on to say that the prisoners were listening to them. How comforting do you think it was for these other guys that had been in there? Two new dudes come in, beaten, tore up, they're locked up, and all of a sudden they start praying and they start singing. How soothing and meditating that must have been for these other prisoners as they're just listening to the words of these hymns being sung to the Lord. And in that, it tells us that there was a great earthquake, the foundations were shaken, everyone's shackles and chains came off, and the door was flung open. And if I'm Paul and I'm Silas, and I saw this, my first reaction would be, I'm out. Peace. This is our opportunity. God has answered our prayer. Let's get out there. Let's get back to it. But again, that's not how they viewed things. In fact, the jailer, he was so nervous, he had thought everybody had escaped. So the Bible tells us he pulled out a sword. He's about ready to fall on it, about ready to kill himself. Paul yells out, hey, bro, don't do it. We are still alive. And then an opportunity to share the gospel takes place. And so Paul, the jailer, comes to Paul, and he says to Paul and Silas, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They say, believe in the Lord Jesus. You and your whole household will be saved. And then they spoke the word to him. He gets saved, they get baptized, his family gets baptized, and then they close out the evening breaking bread and having a meal together. So, why is this such a great encouragement to us? Well, it's for the reasons that we have seen here. There are times in this venture of faith that we have where it is going to go smooth. There are times when you're going to see conversions. There's times when you're going to see miracles. There's times, like for us in Mexico, we're going to see grapefruit from kids coming into the orphanage and their lives being changed. But you know what? There's also going to be times of maybe God saying no. And there's going to be times when you might even get beat up, whether that's physically or spiritually. And there's going to be times when you feel like you are in the depths, the pits of despair, the inner prison, feeling like you're ready to give up. And brothers and sisters, that is the time when we must and most importantly should be worshiping and praying. It's not fair for us to pray and give God thanks and glory when everything is going well. And we don't do that when everything is not going well. Because he's still the same God, and he never changes, and he's still working. So even though we feel like, Lord, have you forgotten about us? Lord, have you forsaken us? He is using those trying moments, those valleys, those pits, those struggles to mold us and shape us 
to continue worshiping him, serving him, praying for him. Uh, I, I recently, about three months ago, I got LASIK surgery. Um, I have been pretty much blind since I was nine years old. So for 30 years, I have been in glasses or contacts. And um, my mom and my brother and my sister both had LASIK surgery and they said, this is crazy, it's life-changing, you've got to do it. And um, so investigated it, looked into it, found out that I was a candidate for it, and so began the preparation for the surgery. Obviously, when you do something like this, you've got to uh, read a lot of, sign a lot of waivers, read a lot of stuff, and you're always reading the disclaimers of what could happen. One of those being you could lose your eyesight, you could go blind. Uh, basically, you, you can't hold us accountable for any of this. So when you read that stuff, it can be slightly discouraging. For me, it was greatly discouraging, and I almost talked myself out of doing the surgery because of what I was reading. But my wife talked me into it, my, my family, and so I went in for this procedure that would take 12 minutes. And it's one of the most fascinating things as they basically cut the top part of your cornea, which is the protective layer of your eye, and they fold it back, and with a laser, they reshape your cornea. So they take the prescription of your eyes, they plug it into the system, and then this laser, literally a laser you cannot see, but as you lay there, 19 seconds in this eye, 18 in this eye, they reshape your cornea to hopefully get you to have 20-20 vision. And so as I was in there and I was laying down and the, the uh, doctors were in there and no doubt I'm, I'm getting very, very nervous and um, you know just not sure of what to expect. And um, 12 minutes later, it was done. And I'll never forget when the guy took the, the patch off my eyes and he said, okay, sit up. And he had me look at this sign and he says, can you see it? And so for the first time in 30 years without any corrective lens or glasses, I was able to see. It was unbelievable. Unbelievable that in 12 minutes you could go from almost being blind to 20-20 vision. And I am now just a huge fan of LASIK surgery. I tell everybody about it. And uh, someone actually shared the story with me of how LASIK surgery was discovered uh, years ago. It's an unbelievable story. A young boy had gotten into an accident and glass, shards of glass had pierced and were stuck in his eye. And so he was taken to this Russian uh, doctor who had the responsibility of removing these little shards and pieces of glass from his eye. And I was reading this, this article in, online about it, and it says that as he was treating this young boy who had fallen and gotten shards of glass stuck in his eye, fortunately the damage was minimal, but a sliver shaved off the cornea the clear tissue that forms a protective layer over the eye. Well, following the accident, the article went on to say, the boy actually noticed a vast improvement in his vision. And so he went back, he talked to this doctor, the doctor examined the child's eyes and he discovered that those tiny cuts from an accident that could have damaged and permanently blinded this young man, those tiny cuts by the glass, they actually reshaped his cornea and they corrected his focus. I think that that is one of the greatest pictures of what we've been talking about. Here, this young man had an accident, zero intention of trying to be a, a help in LASIK vision. This young boy had an accident, went to the doctor, trying to save his vision. And as a result of this difficult, painful, shards of glass, cutting surgery, surgery that took place to remove it, something better came out of it. And isn't that true for us as believers? Isn't that true of what we see here with the Apostle Paul and Silas? What seemed to be game-changing, life-ending, painful difficulty was only one more step to a greater and better thing that God had done. And that is how the early church 
in Philippi was birthed. It was birthed out of pain and struggle and beatings and arrests and being in prison and prayer and worship and concluding that God. And so my encouragement to you all today, what are the conclusions that you're making? What is, what is the, the filter that you're using upon ministry and your church and your life and everything? Are you using your own lens and your own conclusions and your own understanding? If you're doing that, you will only be discouraged and um, bummed out <laughs> when things don't go. But when we put your way, but when we put the lens of God on, when we focus through what his word says, what we know to be true, then God will continue that great work which he started. So praying for you all. Thank you for this opportunity to share with you. God bless you. Man, I love that guy. He is a good friend. I'm excited for him to be back in Florida. If you are a local pastor, friend, listener, whatever, uh, and you live in South Florida, we're actually going to have a golf tournament in May. May 17th, I believe, Saturday, maybe the 16th. I don't know, around that weekend. It's blocked off on my calendar to spend some time with the guy because he's going to be coming. We're, uh, our church is actually sponsoring a golf tournament. Uh, you can find out all that information at www.hob, like House of Blessing, golf. Dot org, hobgolf.org. You can bring a team. You could do sponsorship. It's an, just a great way to continue to raise funds for the orphanage that he directs down in Mexico. And we love as a church serving him, encouraging him, uh, and the work that God is doing in Mexico. Uh, another person I want to connect you with uh, this episode is my pastor. That's right. Uh, I actually have, I feel like, two pastors. I grew up uh, in a, the church. Uh, my spiritual father and biological father are one and the same. My dad, Joe Williams, uh, is a great pastor. He's a great guy. And I actually, um, when got married, left the church that I was in and I grazed, was grew up in and left and served at Calvary Chapel of Olympia with Pastor Chuck Lynn. Uh, I call him my pastor. Uh, he's a good, dear friend. He's a man of God. And I just uh, was able to be in Washington State as I go back and visit, sit down with him. And I'm always sitting down with him. He's not the type of guy that records a lot. Uh, he's definitely not about himself. He just wants to minister and be uh, with people and make it all about Jesus. But I was like, listen, man, you got to share some Proverbs, some wisdom. You got to to help me out. Let me interview you. Let me do some stuff. You know, There's some some stuff that you have that I want to share with people. And, and so he just shared about Trust in the Lord. And so I was like, listen, as we're talking about the ways God's works, we need to trust in God that His ways are different than ours, and we can trust Him. And so here is Pastor Chuck Lynn, uh, the founding pastor of Ch uh, Calvary Chapel of Olympia. Olympia. He serves uh, on our board at Redemption Church and also has passed on that church and is in his uh, retirement years. And the funny thing is, he tells me he uh, is more busy being re retired, quote unquote, uh, than being a senior pastor. He is studying and, and teaching and doing all this different stuff all over. And God is still using him in mighty ways. And so here's some wisdom from him from the Proverbs about trusting God. Proverbs uh, 3, 5, and 6. Enjoy. This is a three-minute message brought to you by Redemption Church, Delray Beach. Hi, I'm Chuck Lind. I was the pastor of Calvary Chapel Olympia, the founding pastor, and Daniel's pastor for quite a while. More so friends, though. I enjoyed thoroughly working with Daniel. It was a joy of my heart. And he's asked me to do a, a little proverb for you and, and just a short little sermonette. And so I'm going to do Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. There's so much there, but this is one of my favorite Proverbs. One, because we know that God wants us to be active, wants us to do things. So we're always making plans. I've had so many plans in my life and, and, and the burden was trying to make them happen. The burden was trying to make them work out. Where here it says, I can trust the Lord with all my heart and I don't have to lean on my own understanding. If he puts something on my heart, he's going to direct me as to how to do it. Sometimes the hardest part is just realizing he wants me to do it. And so 
so when God puts things on my heart now, I've learned to start to pray about them. And, and as I think about them, I do make plans. I too, do try to figure it out. But at the same time, I realize that He will direct my paths. There's going to be different directions He takes me in. Sometimes He gives me an idea and I think, okay, this is what He wants me to do. But then as I get closer to that, it's really about something else. He took me down this road so that He could show me something else. That even even happened with our building here. We wanted to buy this building and, and then I thought, no, it's, it's not the right place, the right location. So we tried other places and we prayed and God blessed us in buying property. But then ultimately it turned out that we could never build in those places, but it earned us enough money to be able to buy this building outright. So the Lord did the whole thing. And, and I was fine with that um, because God directs your steps and that's what he wants to do. The goal of your life is to follow the will of the Lord wherever he is just like with the fishermen remember they were out in the boat and Jesus says hey try the other side and you're thinking well that doesn't make sense if fish aren't on one side or the other side of the boat but when the Lord tells you to do something it may not make sense at first but when you obey and when you serve him and you do what he wants you to do there's always that blessing and the real blessing you get to do it with the Lord you get him he is not a means to an end he is the end and so trusting in the Lord is the best thing you can do you can make plans but acknowledge him Lord this is your plan this is your will this is your church and we want to trust in you to accomplish what you want and when you do you end up with more of him and that's really the ultimate goal to know him and to love him more well speaking of my pastors i want to share another uh person with you my pastor my dad as well uh joe williams always comes and is a big supporter of the ministry but really just my life i love him that's why i don't really call him a uh, pastor i call him a dad He's my spiritual father. He's my biological father. He's a guy I love and look up to. And uh, I just like having conversations with him, man. You just pull out stories and things that uh, that maybe in my culture and my family growing up, I thought was sort of normal. Uh, but actually, as I have walked with Jesus and as pastoring myself, I'm like, wow, this is he's the real deal, man. He did this and we did this and that. And, um, you know, just to give you an example, uh, just since I'm talking and we're hanging out now, uh, I remember I was I grew up in, in a really bad neighborhood. Um, my mom had her teaching degree, and uh, she ended up homeschooling us because of violence and different things in our area. Uh, and the gospel was so real. My dad worked a full time job and pastored the church, and it was such a part of our lives that being homeschooled, I stayed up until midnight every night because my dad worked swing shift. So my mom wanted us to stay up late and to sleep in, so we wouldn't wake up until 11 a.m., 12 p.m. Uh, in the morning so my dad could wake wake up in the morning have pastoral calls time of god study and then go to work and work uh swing shift and so like i just think this is normal like oh this is what you do when there's family uh when there's holidays you just have people that have no family to come over to your house or you feed the homeless or you share the gospel or uh, you change your entire life for the gospel this is what we do as christians right that's the example that I had growing up. That's what I appreciate about my parents. They were the same uh, in the pulpit uh, as they were at the house. Uh, they were the same at church as they were around the family table, uh, dinner table. So my dad is just a preacher, and he's going to preach on Sunday morning, and he's going to preach on Tuesday afternoon. Uh, and it's just funny to be around that, to have your life. And you know what? I want to give that gift to my children. I want to be who I am and have integrity where no matter where I go, what I do. Uh, and so I'm really excited to talk about an important subject. And many of you people that have walked with God, people have probably asked you uh, this question, uh, church leaders, uh, what is the will of God for my life? And so I just sort of brought that question to my dad. Hey, how do we know the will of God? If we're talking about even this episode, like God does things differently. Well, how do I know his, his will and, and his will for my life? And what should I do? And who should I marry? And oh, the list goes on and on and on. But I hope that, that that next episode will actually bless you. And so enough of my ranting. You're going to enjoy it. It's going to be the next episode. Episode number seven. I'm going to talk about uh, decision making and the will of God with my dad, Pastor Joe Williams at Calvary Chapel of Tacoma. Super excited for that. But until next week, we will talk to you later. Praying for you. Hope all is well. And again, if you want to reach out to me, man, email me, daniel at eeleaders.com. 
gmail.com. I'd love to just connect with you, take you out to coffee, especially if you're in South Florida, in Delray Beach area. Man, it's my treat. Let me know. We will talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you so much for listening to this Leadership Lessons podcast. You can watch all the episodes and get all the show notes at eeleaders.com. If this podcast was a blessing to you, I would love for you to share it with your friends on social media. You can find us on social media at EE Leaders. You can also help us spread the word by simply writing a review on iTunes or Google Play. My hope for you with this podcast is that it will encourage you and equip you to continue to serve Jesus. Because remember, there's nothing better than doing what God has called you to do.